Good morning. It's good to be with you again today. I want you to remember today, this is the day that the Lord has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in today. My prayer is that God will encourage you today, not only as we're gathered here together, but simply encourage you, you know, in your walk with the Lord. Remember, as we're looking at the book of Revelation, it shows us Christ. It's all about Christ. But the book of Revelation is written to his church. That's us. And it's meant to motivate us to serve him well in the here and now. You know, as we move to Revelation, we're going to be looking ahead at his promise, the Lord's promise, what he's going to do, when he's going to do it, how he's going to do it. And it motivates us in everything that we do. That's our great motivation to be with the Lord and to see Jesus Christ bring everything together that he's promised. But it's to motivate us to walk with the Lord and to do it well, to be obedient to him, to honor him today as a church. So that's my prayer for us as we go through Revelation, that that indeed is, is what happens in our walk. And in, in your life, and it also simply shows you Jesus Christ. As you're walking through Revelation with us, maybe you're wondering about who Jesus is and, and his program and, and what it means for you. And I want to give you a chance to meet Jesus Christ and have a personal relationship with him. So that's our goal. We're in chapter 3 as we're moving through. Jesus through John is speaking to his church, which means he's speaking to a specific church. He's speaking to the churches that are there then at the time that this letter is going out, and he's speaking to us, his church, in the church age. When the rapture occurs, that church age will come to an end, and, and God will have another phase of his prophetic program that will, that will move into place. Right now we're in that church age, and chapter 2 and 3 show that to us and are speaking to us. And so we're in Revelation 3. Here, the emphasis in this passage is on Jesus as he affirms his church. Remember, in every passage, really the focal point is Christ. It's about him. What he calls his church to do, what he's promised to do on behalf of his church, the path that he has for us to walk as his church. And so today, as we come to chapter 3, we see Jesus Christ, as he does with all the churches, address a specific church. The church that we're looking at today is Philadelphia. And uh, so it's a church that you know well. If you know the name Philadelphia, you know that it's associated with what? Brotherly love? Oh, I've got this backwards. So here we go. So it's a church that's named uh, for brotherly love. There was, there was, there's history there where a former king showed such a kind of love to his brother that 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 quality became attached to the king and therefore became attached to the city, became known as a city of brotherly love. It's kind of neat. It's an agricultural city, uh, very well known for its grape, its harvesting of grapes, wine, all of those things that were part of that. And uh, it was called the Gateway to the East. So this major road that went through Asia Minor, this circle, we're over here. And, and so as you would leave Philadelphia, you would go clear to the east, and it would be that, it would be that gateway. And so it was very strategic in that way. And so here we have Philadelphia. Uh, again, it has, it has the temples that were associated with, with all the cities that we see in this region. Uh, worship of Caesar, worship of, of Greek and Roman gods. And so that is the culture, that is the, that is the scene really for all these churches that we're seeing. And, uh, and so Jesus now is writing specifically to this church. And as he does, again, he's highlighting qualities that speak to his church today, that speak to us right now as we listen? What is it that he has for us to learn from this message, this letter to him? And I want you to remember, as the recipients receive this letter, they have in mind chapter 1 already. They have in mind, they, have, they, have, they know the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They've seen the ministry of Jesus Christ through the eyes of those four Gospels. But now they see through the eyes of John, Jesus Christ resurrected, ascended to glory, now in glory, and now in that glory communicating with John, he portrays and presents his full deity, his full, his full glory to, to John. And that is the basis now for everything that unfolds here in the book of Revelation. The first thing that he does, and what he does with each church, is he examines that church, he assesses that church, he looks at the needs of that church, we are here in chapter 3, and again, this phrase comes up with every church. Verse 8, he says, I know. I know your works. I know what defines you. I know the characteristics. I know the qualities of your church. I know everything about you. I know your history. I know your tendencies, what you have done, what you haven't done. As he looks into our life, our personal life, he does the very same thing. 
He sees all of those same things in our life. And so we're always being called to listen to the Word of God as it speaks to our heart, to listen to the Spirit of God as He speaks into our life, that we might continue to learn, to grow, to assess, to examine, so that we might be like Christ. So here he looks specifically at Philadelphia. Let's learn what he sees. <clears throat> he says here in verse 8, he says, Behold, I have set before you uh, an open door which no one is able to shut, and I know that you have but little power. The first thing he sees here is he affirms them, he commends them, which is interesting, right? He says, I know that you have little power. So we have, we have Philadelphia here. It's, it seems to indicate something about, about the quality of Philadelphia, this church that's here. It seems to indicate that, uh, that the church here is small, uh, is insignificant in many ways compared to maybe other churches that would have been larger. It's interesting, though, as you look at, at Acts and you look here at these churches, how many times you see that many of the churches that, that uh, Paul wrote to, that John wrote to, that others, that they're small churches, and yet God uses them significantly. Philadelphia is one of these churches. Philadelphia is not a large church. It's not a significant church in size. So many times we simply assess churches all through our cities and our culture and all around us where we live right now. We look at them based on size. We look at them based on their programs. We look at them based on how many things they offer, how many people come. And Jesus looks at the ministry of his church so very differently than that. Uh, he's the one who grows churches. But he, his growth is, is uh, counted in so many different ways. Numbers, yes, but so much more than that. It is the growth of hearts, spiritual growth, transformation of lives. The Lord looks at, at Philadelphia and he sees this as, as a, an affirmation to them. I know you have little power, but we're reminded in Scripture that when we're weak, when we're insignificant, that's when God is at his greatest in our life. That's when his power uh, comes alive. You know, when you and I have to depend on God, and when we do that, we see God be significant in our life. He often maneuvers us into situations where we don't have the answers, we're not in control, we're not in charge. We don't have the resources. Uh, we don't see how uh, uh, something's going to be accomplished or done. And so simply in faith, we trust the Lord. The Lord is using this church in a significant way, irregardless of its size. The size has nothing to do with the size of the power of God in that church, the strength of the power of God in that church. He commends them. He acknowledges before them. You have little power. You have little power, but you are full of power because you have me. In my life, in our life, in our church, in our churches, that's the most significant thing. As we continue on, we see this in verse 8, Yet you have kept my word. He affirms them, he acknowledges them because they are obedient to his word. This church is defined, the quality of this church you know, the makeup of this church, as you walk into this church, what you see is a group of believers who on the whole, the church is defined by the quality that they are walking in, in harmony with the Lord. They're obedient to the Lord. Their desire is to do the will of God. That is a great church. That is a mark of a church that stands out. You and I want that kind of church. You and I want to be that kind of follower of Jesus Christ. That's what he affirms here in this church. You have kept my word. You have, in verse 10, he says this, and uh, he says, you have patiently endured, we see in verse 10. You have kept my word about patient endurance. He says, you have, you have patiently endured. You've kept my word. It hasn't been easy. You know, it's never easy to be faithful, to go through adversity, uh, to lack wisdom, but to ask of God who gives wisdom fully, right? It is a walk of faith every day. And he says, you know what? You have patiently endured. You have obeyed patiently. I want that affirmation. I want that testimony. You want that. Te we want that testimony as believers. And so it takes work. It takes a, a yielding of the will to God and say, that's what I want. And I will, I will move towards that. He says also in, in uh, verse 8, he says, and you have not denied my name. He affirms them. You've not denied the name of Jesus Christ. You have identified with me. In a culture, in a pagan culture, where everyone is worshiping false gods, 
worshiping the emperor who is in charge over you, as it seems. You're not bowing to him. You're not bowing to these other gods. You're not succumbing to the pressure of the culture around you. You have stayed true to me. He calls you and I to do the same thing, that we might stay true to him, no matter the pressures against us from our culture, from our schools, from our job, from our neighbors, our peers, social media, platforms. When we were able to stand uh, strong and true and follow after Jesus Christ, no matter what, Jesus Christ will honor that. He will affirm that in your life. Pray that God will just give you the boldness to continue that kind of path in your life. You've not denied my name. And you have, you have stood under adversity. You have stayed strong under adversity, it says here. Um, that's what they've done. They've continued to do that. And um, patient endurance... That's what they've done. The adversity here is in verse 9. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. He says, you have faced real adversity here. The adversity here is are, are Jews who live in the area, but they, he says here, they are Jews, but they are not Jews. They are of the lineage of David, but they are not of the heart of God. They are not children of God. They are. They have that heritage, that that lineage, but but that that is not a guarantee. Our heritage, our family tree, how we've grown up, is no guarantee at all of our relationship with Jesus Christ. He said, "The Jews here have no relationship with me." They are Jews in name. They are Jews in lineage. They have the DNA of the Jews, but they do not have God's DNA written on their heart. There is no relationship with God. There is, there, they have not called upon Jesus Christ as Savior. In fact, they have made the ministry of the believers here in Philadelphia hard, miserable, as in all these churches. They see the Christians as a threat. They see the Christians as blasphemers. blasphemers. And so they continually go after the believers here, harass them. In other ministries, other churches we've seen here that they've drawn them into court. In some, they have even uh, faced the, the, the penalty of death. And so it's not been easy. It's been a great hardship and a great adversity. You know what? If we're following after Jesus Christ, most certainly there is someone in our life that's making our walk with the Lord difficult because they hate what God is doing in our life and the truth that's coming from our life. And so we pray to the Lord and say, Lord, help me to stand strong. Help me to continue. We're going to come back to that later. What does Jesus do? He affirms them. He loves them. He encourages them. He designates a path for them. He says, here's what I want you to do. In verse 11, we see that. In verse 11, he says, uh, hold fast what you have. Hold fast. Hold fast. Hang on. Uh, this is said also of uh, Pergamon. This is said of Thyatira, the same thing. The church in Pergamos, uh, he said to them, you are holding fast. He says to the church in Thyatira, and he says to the church here in Philadelphia, hold fast, continue. All three churches, he says, you're to hold fast. You're to stay strong. Let no one seize your crown, it says here in verse 11. Um, be faithful to the very end. The crown of life. Um, when we walk faithfully, it's an affirmation that our salvation is true and genuine. He's not talking here about losing our salvation. He's talking about the affirmation of the walk of faith. He's also talking about the rewards that he promises to all of his children, that we might not lose reward, that we might be faithful to the end and finish the fight and finish it well, be a finishers who finish strong. That's what he's talking about here. And he, if, that's what he calls them to. He says, I just want to encourage you. He says, as you walk, you have been faithful. Continue that faithfulness to the very end. Now I turn the corner because with all the churches, all seven churches, he's, he's very careful. John is to show the emphasis that Jesus Christ enables every believer to do what he calls us to do. Whatever the Lord calls us to do from his word in our life, he always enables us to do that. Every time. He never leaves us uh, alone in our own power and our own strength and our own wisdom and our own might. He just doesn't do that. 
He says, I love you so much. I'm, I give you everything you need. So let's see how he does that. The most significant here, it's it repeated every time, is simply the ministry of the Holy Spirit. At the very beginning of, of this book, the re, this book of Revelation, he says uh, the word of God is to be read. We're to hear it. We're to read it for ourselves. We're, it's to be read in the churches. We're to hear it from our heart and we're to keep it. And he says we're to hear with not only the ears of our head but the ears of our heart. And that, that leads to obedience. That leads to faithful walk before the Lord. It's individual. Let him hear and let the churches hear. These letters are going out not just to these specific churches. These letters are going out to all of these seven churches, to all the churches that Paul wrote to, and these letters are going out to us. God is calling us to rely upon the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus Christ is front and center in all these letters. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It shows us how Jesus Christ is enabling by His power in your life the ability to be faithful, to finish well. So we see characteristics of Christ that are applied to our life, and we see promises of Christ that He gives to His church. Let's look at those character, character qualities that He shows us about Himself. Well, in verse 7, we see this. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, he says, these are the words of the Holy One, the words of the Holy One. This describes Jesus completely. This is his very essence. This is his very nature. Um, he is God completely. Three persons, one God. As God the Father is called holy, 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 that attribute applies fully to Jesus Christ as well. We see even his enemies affirm the holiness of Jesus Christ. A demon himself affirmed that. As Jesus cast that demon out, this demon says, What have you come to do to destroy us? The demon says, I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. This demon was terrified of Jesus Christ because he recognized in him that he was God, that he was holy, that he was fully righteous and, and could not look upon sin and hated sin. This demon was the very definition of sin. He was terrified of Christ. The disciples themselves affirm this. The disciple says, we have believed, we believe you, we have come to know you, that you, you are the Holy One of God. Here in this, in this account, when many were turning away from Jesus Christ, Jesus said to the disciples, are you going to leave too? And they said, to, to who else shall we go? You are the one. You are the only one. You are the one who has the words of life. You're the Holy One of God. Jesus Christ is holy, and so He enables us to be able to be holy in our walk before Him as well. We are holy before Him positionally. When He saves us, he cleanses and He washes our sins. We are holy before Him forever. Yes, we do sin, but that is covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Yes, we sin. We need to confess that so we stay in fellowship with the Lord. Yes, we sin. We need to confess that so we have power in our lives, so that the Lord blesses us for ministry. But we positionally are holy before the Lord, just as Jesus Christ is. He says to you this morning, I'm holy, and I will help you be holy in your walk as well. He also says here in verse 7, the words of the Holy One and the True One. He is true. He is authentic. He is the original. He is the one and only. He's not manufactured. He's not man-made. He's not a copy of something else. Jesus Christ is God. He is fully God. Here we have in Revelation itself, tribulation martyrs crying out to God, O Sovereign Lord, holy and true. They are crying out to Him that He would act on their behalf. As the tribulation unfolds, they are crying out to Him and saying, God, how long until all of this is done? Holy God. They affirm that. You are true. You are true. It says here also in this verse, you, you have the key of David. You have the key of David. And it says here, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one will open. He possesses the key of David. This is significant. We're going to see this. Okay. It says here in this verse, which we just read, He opens, no one can shut, and He shuts and no one can open. They both go together. They are connected here together. This is a quality of Jesus that's significant. Let's see what this means. 
Well, we remember this prophecy from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. I'm going to draw three pieces from it. It speaks to Jesus Christ who will have the government, the, all of the government of this world upon his shoulder. One of the qualities that will define him is he will be called everlasting father. Isn't that interesting? We have the father, but an attribute that is attributed to Jesus Christ is this fatherness as well, this element of being father over us. And he will be on the throne of David and over his kingdom. This comes true as it applies to what we read here about the key of David that Jesus Christ possesses. We go to Isaiah 22, we see a, an individual here named Eliakim. He is a man who is given a position in Israel, over Israel. He represents the king, and it says, it says here of him, it's a, it's a political position. Uh, he controls who sees the king. Uh, he, he makes decisions that will reflect the priorities of the king. Uh, he comes to reflect and to be a foreshadowing of what Jesus Christ will be. Because we see here in, in this passage, Eliakim right here, he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And we see that tie back to Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, where Jesus Christ is called an everlasting father. Um, he is the servant of the Lord. I will place on his shoulder, we saw that in Isaiah 9, the key of the house of David. And Jesus Christ comes ultimately to, to picture this fully. Eliakim is... Is a, is a word picture for what Jesus Christ will be. In a sense, he's a, he's a typology for what Jesus Christ is. Uh, he's a prefiguring of what Jesus Christ will see here. And it is a foreshadowing of, of what we see in being fulfilled here in Revelation. Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign. He has the key of David. What does that mean fully? Well, there's already a key that's been mentioned here in Revelation. In chapter 1, verse 18, Jesus says, I'm the living one, I died. Behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Here he has authority over death and over judgment. I have the key. The person who has the keys is the person who's in charge, who has authority. Jesus Christ says, I am the, I am the ultimate authority. I have full authority over everyone who dies, over the domain of death, and over the judgment the consequence slash reward of all people. Here we see now in this verse, Jesus, the second key, he has the key of David, the key of David. Here, here he's, he's communicating. He's, he opens, no one can shut. He shuts, no one can open. What we're getting here are glimpses of Jesus Christ being sovereign over who can come into heaven, having authority, being the final say, the final voice, over who can come into heaven. When we die, we either go into heaven in eternal relationship with him, or we are refused from coming into heaven, we are separated from him, and we are sent to hell for all eternity. Jesus Christ has full authority over who goes in and who does not. So let's see, let's see a connection here, even to us. There's a contextual connection that we see. Matthew chapter 16, regarding the gospel. Jesus says to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. This verse has been misused and misunderstood by some. It says, Peter has the authority over who can be saved and who can't. That's not what's being taught here at all. He says to Peter, whatever you bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This has everything to do with simply the authority of the Word of God. We're going to see its connection in just a minute as well. It's the authority of proclaiming the Word of God with power and with certainty. God's Word is truth. When we speak the Gospel, we have the authority to say, based upon profession of faith, genuine faith in Christ, you are loosed from your sins and you are, you are, you are given an, an open door into a relationship into heaven. Should you reject the gospel and reject the word of God, you are, you are bound. You are bound from entering into heaven. You are prohibited from entering into heaven. What, what Jesus is calling Peter to do here is simply to proclaim the, the gospel with power, with confidence, and to be able with the other disciples and apostles to simply affirm to those who hear, this is the message of the gospel. Should you heed it in faith, God will open up to you relationship and so we proclaim to you that you, 
you have then relationship with heaven. You are loosed from your sin and in relationship. Should you reject that gospel, you are bound in your sin. You are in bondage to your sin. You, are, you will be refused from entry into heaven. It's not Peter's choice. It's Peter's proclamation of the gospel. We see here in Matthew chapter 18, just to affirm that, he's writing now to the church, all of us. Truly I say it to you, the church, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. It's the context of church discipline. Here, uh, here if I reject the word of God and I reject repentance and I reject confession of sin and turning to Christ, I am still bound in my sin, then the church must act upon that believer or, the, or with the gospel, we must, we must communicate to an unbeliever, until you come to Jesus Christ in faith, you are bound in your sin. Here for the believer, if I, if I confess my sin and I repent of my sin, and I, re, I will then be restored to Jesus Christ, I will be loosed from the power of that sin in my life, and I will be free now to serve the Lord. So we're given that same key. It's not the key to save people. It's the, see, it's the, it's the key to, to proclaim the truth of the gospel, the power of the gospel in our lives. The, the opposite of that is what we see in the Pharisees and Sadducees. Matthew 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you're hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's face. You neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. They bind themselves and they bind everyone who hears from being able to go into heaven. They shut the door. And so that's the opposite. We are given the power to proclaim the gospel. The gospel opens hearts. Rejection keeps it closed. When we proclaim the gospel, we're proclaiming that choice. You have a choice to receive Christ, to be freed, loosed from your sins. Or you can reject the truth of the gospel, the hope, the promise of the gospel, the person of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, and be bound in your sins. When Jesus is given the keys of of David, he's giving the authority over, over ultimately the rule and reign of the Davidic kingdom of who will come into heaven, of who will be in relationship for all eternity. He gives that to the church, not the power of saving, but the power of proclaiming the gospel, the, the power of affirming the gospel, not just verbally, but with my life. He communicates that. That's, that's the quality, that's the character of Jesus, as we see here in Revelation. Now he, he affirms the church, he enables the church, he says, let me show you how I, I'm here to help you in your walk with the Lord. He says here in verse 8, he says, behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. That's what he does. Here we have the promise and there we have the reward of the gospel. And it really, it's so much more. He's, this open door he's talking about is the, is the door of relationships, the door of the gospel, having changed their lives. It's the door of eternal security. It's the door of all these things. But it's much more than that. Let's see that. It's salvation. Jesus says, I am the door. That is salvation. Whoever comes in will be saved. And not only that, it's daily provision and will go in and out and find pasture. Jesus is the open door, not just to salvation. He's the door. He's the provision for your life, my life, every day as we walk gospel witness our prayers that god may open for us a door for the word for the mystery of christ god opens doors so that we have an opportunity to share christ he is the he is the one who opens doors we are we are praying as a church we're praying as individuals we're emphasizing and and challenging you to have a life to life ministry that you would be intentional in reaching into people in your circle in your life with the gospel for the sake of Jesus Christ and pray that God would give you open doors and we pray for each other that God would do that. He said it wouldn't be easy. Paul says I have a wide door. God's given me a wide door for effective ministry, for work, but there are many adversaries. Even though God opens a door for you, he doesn't say to you and I it's going to be easy. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be hard. It will, it will necessitate prayer. It will necessitate humbly depending on Jesus Christ. But it will be an open door that is clear and obvious. We must walk through that and take that door, but it's not going to be easy. But Jesus Christ will enable you. Pray that God will give you the confidence and the strength 
to take the open doors He gives you. Hebrews chapter 10 reminds us those open doors are our access. It's God's grace. It's power. We have the confidence to enter into the very holiest of place when we engage Jesus Christ in prayer. And He's open for us, that, that relationship, that door. God is the God of open doors. Jesus Christ is the God of open doors. He opens doors for us. He opened a door for Philadelphia here that no one could shut. They were genuine believers. No one could take that away from them. He was giving them open doors for ministry. And they simply needed to follow and obey and take advantage of those in their life. Another promise that he gives to us here is here in verse 9. He says, I'm going to take care of your enemies. I'm going to take care of your enemies. Let's look at that here in verse 9. We see these false Jews. Look at the second half of that verse. I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. That's so beautiful. We have false Jews who are attacking the believers, but Jesus Christ says, I'm going to bring them before you. I will deal with them. They will one day honor you. They will one day bow down before you. And this is what they're going to know. They're going to know, oh, it's not about you and you're great. And wow, I should have done. They're going to know that I have loved you. When our enemies see God in our life, that is who they respond to in our life. Not to us, but to God and what he's done. Let's just, let's just share some words here that might be encouraging. Here in Philippians, we see that we see an ultimate promise. Everyone will bow before Jesus Christ, believer and unbeliever. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Whether I do in this life or after I have died and I am separated from Christ, I will still honor, bow before Jesus Christ. Every human being who has ever lived will humbly bow before Jesus Christ. It will either be celebration for the believer or it will be humiliating defeat and yet acknowledgement as an unbeliever before Jesus Christ. Let me talk about enemies for just a second. Here they're facing enemies. We're told here that enemies, we're not to get even with them. We're never to avenge ourselves. We're to leave it to God. Let God take care of that as he is doing here with the believers in Philadelphia. Basically he's saying to them, don't get even with them. Don't go after them. Don't hate them. I will take care of it. You continue to follow me. That's what he calls us to do as well. Enemies were to love them. Love your enemies and do good to them. Do good to those who hate you. He would say to the church here in Philadelphia, continue to minister to them. Love them with grace. He says to us, love our enemies and do it with grace. We have difficult people in our life. I want you to name those people on your heart. I want you to write those names down. And I want you to begin praying over your own heart towards them. Pray for them, yes, but pray for you, that you might view them as God would have you to view them, that you might serve them and see them as God would have you to do that. We're to overcome evil with good, our enemies. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. As far as is possible, live peaceably with all. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That is God's power alone. We can't do that ourselves. Another promise he makes, I will keep you from the great tribulation. He says here in verse 10, he communicates that, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole earth. To try those who dwell on the earth, that's what he says here. There's an hour of trial, it's coming, and I'm going to try those who dwell on the earth. Here we have a, a, a pre-millennial look. Uh, something that's going to take place before the millennium takes place. Here we have a, a question. Is this referring to a, a pre-rapture or a post-rapture? We're going to be talking about things, these as we move into Revelation. And here's the debate around this, this verse. Uh, it's this. Is Jesus saying, I'm going to keep you from that trial, or am I going to guard you through that trial? That's the question, right? So let's look at that here from, from verse 10. I will keep you from the hour of trial. What is it he's saying? Some would say he's communicating here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep you through this trial. I'm going to guard you through this trial. That's what I'm going to do. You're going to go through it, but I'm going to guard you through it. They would, they would take us to John 17, 15. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, believers, all the believers, but that you keep them from 
the evil one. The key is the word from, ek. Is it, is it from or through? Okay. So they would come to this verse and say that Jesus is promising to keep his church through the tribulation. But we see this here. This is referring simply to general the general testing and tribulation that believers uh, go through here. The context here is not the great tribulation. It's not the seven-year tribulation. It's tribulation, trial, adversity, testing that we simply go through as believers. Some would say in Revelation 7, 3, when, G, when it is said here, we have sealed the servants of our God, here in Revelation 7, that's referring to the church. It's not. It's Israel. Here we have the 144,000. These are Jews that are sealed and set apart for the work and ministry of Jesus Christ. I believe that what this is referring to, and it's key to the rest of the book, to all the book, the Revelation, how we see this here, that it's Jesus is referring to keeping us from this hour of testing. He's keeping us from the hour of trial. He's keeping us from, uh, from that hour. And the focus is on those who dwell on the earth. Let's see that. This hour is that great tribulation. There will be a great tribulation such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. This is a specific time period, a specific tribulation that takes place. This is the seven years. Here we have martyrs for Jesus Christ. These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. These are those who are being killed because of their testimony for Jesus Christ. The church is gone, but people are being saved during these seven years, this hour of great tribulation. In Daniel, we see these, the 70 weeks prophecy that's given to us. We see the first seven weeks refer to the rebuilding of Jerusalem. We see the next 62 weeks lead up to the ministry of Jesus Christ and his crucifixion. And it appears like there is, he has nothing, but he does, because he dies, but then he rises again. So we have those weeks. These are, these are periods of seven years, prophetically, that add together. And then there is a gap between the 69th year and the 70th year. The 70, 70th year is, is where the Antichrist makes a covenant with many for one week. That one week is seven years. This is the 70th week. The Great Tribulation is that. We'll talk about that more. It's a time of great distress, specifically for Israel. That day is so great, there is none like it. It's a time of distress for Jacob. Jacob's trials, Jacob's troubles is what it's called. Israel is going to be brought under, under great punishment as a nation. Not only that, though, Daniel 12 tells us Israel will be restored. It's one of the purposes of the tribulation. It'll be a time of trouble, but at that time, he says, your people will be delivered. Everyone whose name was written in a book, the book of life is what that is. The nation will be, will be given a heart to repent and come to the Lord at the end of the tribulation. Here's a result in Jeremiah. I will break the yoke from Israel. I will burst your bonds. Foreigners will no more make a servant of Israel. They will no longer be under bondage to other nations ever again and they shall serve the Lord their God. At the end of the tribulation, Israel will have been dealt with as a nation for the last time. They will now be restored and loved by Jesus Christ for all eternity, never again to be punished or brought under the dominion of, of foreigners. This is one of the great purposes of the tribulation. The other focus in this verse 10 is the earth dwellers. Revelation 6.10, here we have Christian martyrs. They cry out, Lord, you are holy and true. How long before you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. The focus is on those who are on the earth doing this great tribulation, these seven years. Philadelphia is promised not to go through this. The church at large is promised not to go through this. The church isn't here. The focus here isn't on the church. God is pouring out his wrath on the world. Pagans, unbelievers, he is judging the world. The church is gone. Yes, people are being saved. Martyrs are coming out of the tribulation. Israel itself is being protected but judged by God. These are the purposes of the tribulation. Revelation 8:13. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth. It is nothing but judgment for those who are on the earth. That is key. Revelation 14:6. I saw an angel, another angel directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, to every tribe and nation and language and people. Here it's the angel 
who will proclaim a gospel message to the entire world. The whole world will hear. We'll talk about that when we get there. The church is not here. There is the witness of individual believers who are being saved, but they are being martyred and, and taken to heaven. And so God in His love communicates the gospel supernaturally in another means, another way, through the angel here. The church is not here. Philadelphia, in this verse, I believe this verse clearly communicates, I will keep you from the hour of trial. You are not going to go through the tribulation. Well, the great answer to that is here. The tribulation hasn't happened yet. Philadelphia is no longer here. They were kept, they were kept from the hour of tribulation, not through the hour of tribulation, because they're not here. The tribulation hasn't happened, so that can't be the case. And it's key as to how we see the rest of Revelation. The church simply is not there. Remember, this is not written just to Philadelphia. It's written to all of his church, the church age. He says also a promise in verse 11, and I'm coming soon. I'm coming soon. You know, we see this clearly. This We've mentioned this every week. This is the great motivation in your life and mine. Jesus says, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming soon. Eternal security. Verse 12. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear with the Spirit says to the churches. He says here we will be made a pillar in the temple of God. New Jerusalem. 21, Revelation, and I saw a holy city, a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for, for her husband. That's relationship there. Jesus, the bride, the church is the husband. Here we see that. I mean, so we see that here. Um, eternal residence, eternal relationship, eternal security. And then verse 12, he talks about his name. God's name, my name, will be stamped upon you. You and I as believers, you believers here in Philadelphia, you will be eternally conformed to Jesus Christ. That's his promise. The name of God, the name of Christ imprinted upon us. Here's the last thought for the day. 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Here's the final transformation that will take place. This is what this is what Jesus is, is showing us and alluding to here in verse 12 and 13 of this passage. Be, beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. We're going to be fully like Jesus Christ. When his name is stamped upon us, what's being communicated is this. My very character will not define you. You will be defined now by the char my character on your life, on your heart. You will be transformed, a new body, incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away. We will be like Christ in every way. Sin will be eradicated from our very existence. We will be fully like Christ. And this is how this verse ends. And it's a fitting way to end our time together this morning. And everyone who has this hope... In Christ purifies himself, even as he is pure. If it is your passion to be like Jesus Christ right now, it will purify you. In other words, it will protect you from the ravages of sin in and around you. It will give you a passion for the holiness of God. It will, it will be the power in your life that will enable you to walk in obedience, faithfully, obediently, from your will, out of a love relationship to Jesus Christ, you will do it right now. You will do it today. Your life will reflect that passion and that desire. Your will will be conformed to Christ. I will yield my will to Jesus Christ when this is my passion. I will say, Lord, have your way in me. Change me, Lord. It purifies me. It makes my motives His. It makes my passions his. It makes my goals His. It makes how I view people in my life His. I become like Him. I begin that work now before it's fully completed when I meet Jesus Christ. Would you pray that God will give you that passion right now, today, when we finish here? Would you stop and pray that God would do that in your life? 
This is the call to us. This is the call of Philadelphia. They were faithful. They were faithful, and God honored them. He didn't, he didn't call them out for anything that they were not doing. He only commended and affirmed them. He wants to do that in your life. He does do that. He enjoys doing that. Give him a chance to be big in your life. That's what I pray. We invite you to meet with us, visit our website, talk to us, contact us anytime. We're here always. I'm here. We love you. We're glad to be able to meet with you today. May God encourage you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice, not only in it and that he's here, but let us rejoice in the opportunity to follow after Jesus Christ and to be like him. Amen and amen. Thank you for joining with us today.